process is a part of bonsai creation is one of these systematic approaches to the technical aspect of bonsai that really allows us to direct and focus our creative energy. For the most part, there is a worked out way to effectively create a tree and follow that process to get to the final result. However, sometimes we get thrown a curveball and this piece of material, this spectacular Sierra Juniper, from the beginning I knew it was special. Just as I pull away a lot of that soil that we're getting a lot of interest right here, this rolling contorted uh, live vein across the front of the tree. We've got this big massive base. We also have a live vein right here that runs up the edge of this and connects to this outer piece. But I didn't know how special it was gonna be. And it really took diving into the styling process of this Sierra Juniper to recognize the complexity of this material as I was standing on stage in 2018 doing a demonstration at the Bonsai Society of Portland Rendezvous event that I had definitely missed how spectacular and how unique this tree was and I needed to pull back and change my process. I want that billowy, I want to show that, I want to carry that aesthetic forward, just this and it sounds just like that too, okay? Now one of the limitations to the Sierra Juniper that I was working on is I couldn't see the entirety of the tree. It was buried in a very deep container and I had no idea where does the deadwood exist, where the live veins finish, how does this interaction that quantifies the aesthetic of a juniper working out in this tree to influence and inform the decisions I'm gonna make design-wise. And so I initiated a design in that demonstration that I felt was safe and that I felt was headed in the right direction but I stopped short of making commitments that would be irreversible so that I could come back in the form of the process, address that tree's root system, change that tree's clothing, if you will, and work through that process of defining live and dead to be able to understand and actualize the maximum capacity and potential that that material possessed. This is the documentation of this process. After the demonstration in 2018, I brought the Sierra Juniper home and I immediately recognized during that demonstration a repot was gonna be the first step in this tree. Now typically with Yamadori, because there's so much complexity in the design process, I like to style first, allowing me to understand that material and nail the initial repot in terms of position, angle, front, etc. But this tree with its complexity and not being able to see, not knowing all the information that the tree had to give me, I needed to pursue that repot first so that I could see the full potential of the base and then let that tree recover from the repotting process to actually be able to carry out the other scopes of work that would inform my aesthetic decisions. Now back in 2020, having the capacity with the tree recovered from the repotting process that was carried out in 2019, we have the ability to confront this material head on, have all the information we need to make the decisions best for the material, and really try to create something as special as the opportunity that presents itself to us. The aesthetic value of a juniper is not just based around the deadwood, but the way the living vein and the deadwood interacts. And inside of this piece of material, it was very clear that there's opportunity for a really spectacular engagement of live and dead, but without actually teasing it out. And with the Sierra Junipers, unnatural ability to roll living tissue over existing deadwood. I had no idea if what I was seeing was actually going to be dead or alive. And this really meant the first step in the styling process was teasing apart those threads of the living and the dead, defining the edges and the boundaries of that live vein, and really isolating and bringing about that contrast of the living and the dead through the preservation of that shari. So before we start the process of actually utilizing a mechanical or even a handheld tool to define that living vein and really start to understand the relationship of the living and the dead in a tree, I always cover up a fresh repot. And this is again part of that process where we don't have that established uh, mossy layer that's protecting that root system from all of the organic matter filtering down through it could really clog up those oxygen spaces. It's nice to just use a paper towel. Now we know we're gonna be utilizing a Fordham. It's, it's such a wonderful tool for this scope of work to be able to um, 
lean on that mechanical device and not have to worry about it coming into contact with these paper towels. They'll tear easily. They won't wrap up in the machine. They won't cause any damage. When you use rags, when you use things that have a lot more substance to them, um, all of a sudden that becomes a hazard that we've got to be aware of with a power tool. Set yourself up for success with the Fordham. Again, just sticking the, these paper towels over that freshly repotted surface as a part of this transition in process gives us the ability, we wet it down, and you see as we wet it down, it just kind of sticks, sort of contours to the container, and just sticks to the surface of the soil. Now that we've got it covered, we're ready to dig into this. And this is actually a tree where we went through and cleaned off the heaviest bark already because we really wanted to focus on reducing all of that dead bark that's adhered to the deadwood, bringing out that quantity of deadwood, showing you how to be really light with the Fordham in terms of not leaving behind tool marks, not defacing or deforming, or think about this as carving. This is not a carving exercise. This is a fundamental way that we can handle the surface of juniper deadwood. Try and leave as little bit of a trace as possible, trying to make it minimal impact but get that bark off so we can see that contrast, okay? Now to do this, again, I'm using the Fordham. If you wanna take a look at our web store, we've got Fordhams available. We specifically created this package of Fordhams with all of the accoutrements and the parts to be able to meet the bonsai need because it was so tough going and finding all these pieces. These carbide burrs that we're using, I've found are the very best. They're not meant to make big, deep incisions in the wood. They're not meant to remove a lot of tissue at once. They scrape, they kind of really leave a toolless surface to the deadwood that allows us to remove that adhered deadwood without damaging and leaving behind all of those signs of tools. After having cleaned that really, really thick bark, and there's still a little bit of this thick bark, you can see those layers that are established on this living tissue where you can see there's thicker and thinner. Whenever you see these, these lines running through the bark right here, you automatically know that there's multiple layers that exist there. When we get down to kind of that range, that proximity to the living tissue, really close to it, a, a few millimeters away is acceptable any more than that. We can uh, have things inside of that living tissue feeding on that living vein, borers, larva, etc. that we wanna be aware of. We need to get down to that, and again, we use that sign of those fissures as a real indication. But when we start talking about utilizing a power tool to tease out this contrast of live and dead and define that living tissue, uh, we're really talking about starting at the base of the tree and defining that entry point where that live vein begins, following that process up the tree. And by being disciplined and starting at the base and working your way up the tree, you're able to much more efficiently kind of follow that path know that you've gotten all of the nooks and crannies and defined every portion of that path and carry that out onto the branching where possible to maximize that contrast of live and dead. And even when I'm thinking about this, I'm also at that same time doing a lot of deadwood work as I'm defining that live vein and creating that contrast because we have areas like this where we have a stump cut that was in the extraction process removed. We have that superficial flatness that exists on that. I wanna break this down remove the tissue that hopefully has the remnants of a decayed or dead live vein on it and save myself the time and the effort grinding all that bark off to then create that deadwood. Let's do it on the front end. Okay, anytime I start to talk about the breakdown of this deadwood, I wanna show and think about the orientation of this to see the grain and see the texture and see the age from the front if possible and if consistent with the story. Now we know that the live vein recedes, right? And has kind of this natural uh, exposure to the elements. The most receded, the, the, the oldest piece that turned to deadwood initially and started that recession process is naturally gonna be the most weathered. And we've gotta be thinking, where is that most weathered portion? Do I keep that? If I do keep that, how am I going ahead and removing this? I noticed that this looks relatively young. You can see the live vein receding downhill from this margin right here. And you can see how smooth this deadwood is here. You see it get a little bit more textured here and you see it be very exposed and textured here. We see the same thing over here. Here's your living tissue. It's receding to the outside of the tree. Smooth, a little bit more textured, a little bit more textured. This shari started right down the middle of this and has been receding in both directions ever since it was initially created, okay? I have that same story that exists in this piece right here. I wanna show a little bit more more of the age. The age right now is facing the backside of the tree. I'm going to start on top here and just start tearing away to try to tap into that older section as if it transitioned in to the top of that gin. And it will also, again, save me the work of reducing that live vein or taking away that dead bark when I'm going to break it off anyways. Here we go. Always splitting parallel with the grain and the formation of the deadwood. 
Okay, and I always like to just get a chunk. Give yourself something to work with. The beaver effect, this nibbling of the, of the dead wood. That's how we start to create really, really poor dead wood. Dead wood that looks artificial, looks like the tip of a pencil. Again, looks like a beaver was chewing on it or something of that nature. That's not really very dramatic dead wood. Okay, when you start getting bigger bites in here, you start exposing the guts of this. You start seeing the interior of the tree. You give yourself these pieces that we can kind of continue to tear and notice that that's removing bark that we would have been spending time grinding off. One of the biggest problems with dead wood work is a lot of times people carry it too far. They actually hit that sweet spot and keep going because they don't know when to pull back. Okay, we're looking for specific things. I want that shadow play. I want that texture. I'm going to earn that texture in terms of how the light moves over this dead wood. That little white piece, that is the edge of my living tissue. We see how it moves around that piece. Really interesting to tap into that. I now know I'm not going to be reducing further into that tissue moving down that. That's where my live vein exists. See if we can transition into here. There we go, okay? And that transitions really nicely, boom, boom. We'll see what we can do to open that up. I've got that live vein running right here and I'm gonna be able to isolate that singular piece. I'm really happy with this and that changes to a large degree, that changes the aesthetic of that base pretty considerably. Now, this really blends in beautifully to this fin. This kind of injects a nice little breakup, living here, dead here, living here. Ooh, I like that magic. Okay, let's go ahead and start this process of reduction, okay? Now, when I do this, again, I always wanna start on the deadwood side. I'm not trying to remove the texture of the old deadwood. I don't wanna do that. I just wanna remove the bark that's adhering to the dead wood and really creating a, a, a gray area between that definition of live and dead. And if I can work with, my, with the rotation of my tool, working in parallel with the grain, I really avoid a lot of tool marks. We're not gonna be able to do that. We're gonna have places where we're gonna have to turn perpendicular. The more perpendicular you get to the grain, the more the, t the bit is gonna wanna dive and it's gonna start to leave these kinds of shapes in that grain unless we're very, very careful and very experienced. When we nick this living tissue as we're doing this cleaning, not a problem as long as they are small wounds and imperfections because it oxidizes, it will be red tomorrow. Within 24 hours, you won't really know that you even made a nick there. So you can see that contrast though, you see that brilliance. I need to be seeing that periodically and I'm gonna work off of that as my boundary here. You can see how beautiful that Fordham allows that work to be. And I'm just gonna continue to find that reference periodically as I work up the tree. Okay, now that we're done cleaning off that adhered bark from that decayed and dead receded living vein, we vacuum out those smaller areas because it's so hard to get all that dust out once it gets wet and it kind of turns into a concrete and really cements itself inside of the fine details of the dead wood. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna remove my towels now. And you can see there's a few areas where we had some gaps or where they were torn over the process of creating dead wood going through this operation. But for the most part, the entirety of our soil mass is left unimpacted by all of that really fine dust that comes from that live vein cleaning process. Now most people think when we're gonna be doing the deadwood work on a juniper, that we need to be washing and scrubbing all of that grit from the mountain off of the tree, but we have to be very careful. The washing process sets us up for success in the painting and preservation process, the application of lime sulfur, but the washing process can set us up for failure as well. Deadwood has a texture, deadwood has a density, deadwood has a character all its own. 
To be very careful in the washing process, to understand that washing too aggressively can strip that deadwood of its patina, can strip that deadwood of its exterior weathered shell that really does respond well to the lime sulfur oxidize and give us that beautiful contrast. Washing is as much a significant technique skill and level of understanding as the actual application of lime sulfur itself. The way that Troy and Ryan handle the washing of this tree is absolutely impeccable and, and paramount to the final product, aesthetically as well as preservative in the deadwood. Now the application of lime sulfur, because we had so much undiscovered deadwood that we brought about by the removal of that bark adhering to the dead sections of the tree meant that we really needed to mesh the boundaries of new and old deadwood. And this is challenging, especially when we're trying to create a beautiful final result, but also just to set the deadwood up for success over the next painting, the second, the third, the fourth, preservation of that deadwood. And this is where we use a touch of watercolor, in addition to our lime sulfur, to give it that extra little boost of white mixed perfectly with black to give it just that shade that makes it look authentic, that makes it look natural, to merge two different textures of deadwood into one singular unit as a representation of contrast to the living tissue. And after washing and thoroughly painting, we're able to understand truly what this piece of material had to offer. And it is absolutely spectacular, informing the design in so many ways beyond what I'd conceptualized when I initially approached this tree. So now that we're washed and painted, it's time to dig into the structure. And again, this is a tree that initially when we were designing this in, in terms of the demonstration uh, at the Bonsai Society of Portland Rendezvous, there was so much undiscovered potential that we now see in terms of the contrast of live and dead, and that does influence our approach. Now, if you look at Sierra junipers in the native environment, they have this really interesting relationship with the environment around them because the wind and the effect that gives direction to these trees, typically straight, upright, grand, big, sentinel-like trees, whenever they have this lateral movement, this is wind-induced movement, and when we see that wind-induced movement, that movement has to be carried through that foliar mass. But there's also other factors that are playing into the movement or the oddities that occur in the shapes of Sierra junipers that I really want to capture with this piece. And that is that impact of massive heavy snow. When we see the Sierra Nevadas, this is the first mountain range that moisture-filled clouds and storms hit as they come off of the Pacific coastline onto the North American continent. And we get massive amounts of accumulation in terms of snowfall, very wet, very heavy. So you have this sculpting lateral movement and then you've got this vertical drop that occurs with this snowfall to create this really interesting lateral down, lateral down, lateral down kind of existence in Sierra junipers. And where we started in the initial demo, moving almost strictly laterally, I see the opportunity to really add some dramatic downward movement to that to see if we can reduce the space front to back that the tree's size kind of occupies, but also just to add that motion in the structural pieces of the tree that really pull that environmental influence and accuracy of that environment into the composition of such a special piece, especially a special piece that has this much deadwood in terms of its distribution and reduction of the living tissue we've discovered over the course of that cleaning process. So I'm gonna start by revamping the initial structure and trying to really tease out as much potential and interest that I possibly can in the shape of this tree, isolating each individual living section, treating it as if it's almost its own tree and trying to reflect both the wind and the snow, directionality, where the branches are gonna drop down the granite, where the granite is protecting the shape of this tree and where the granite is no longer buffering the capacity of the wind to alter the shape and guide that directional growth. This was the story that I wanted to tell when we started going back back into the structure and really enhancing, perfecting, and finalizing the design that I initially conceptualized on stage in 2018. Closing down that structure, firming up that design, moving forward with confidence based on all the information we had, this was part of the process that was necessary for a piece this mature and a piece this spectacularly unique. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set this structural piece down on top of it. I know what I wanted to do with this originally. We had talked about leaving it high. I've untied this so we could do the live vein deadwood work. 
Now we're coming back to it and I'm gonna come back to the structural point and I'm really gonna to try to lower it this time. There's so much more deadwood up top, live vein deadwood interaction that I wanna show, whereas I couldn't see that when we made the initial structural moves, that information impacts that design. That's where we backed off, we came back, we did things in the correct order to be able to give ourselves that opportunity. This is another one of those moments that we can maximize design. When you work with a significant piece of material, you gotta take time trying to rush through it, style it like every other tree. That's very easy, right? This tree looks like every other tree. Then you know what you're supposed to do. You do it really fast. Everybody says, oh, good job. We understand it. It's so simple. When you have to move through these nuances and take what you're being offered by the tree and try to capitalize every single time, it takes time. That process, that journey of letting the tree influence you, of taking in that information, of trying to show what that information is looking like in your mind as you convey it to the tree. This is uh, more of a dialogue. This is more of a creation, more of a collaboration. And I like to take that time. I like to see it happen. I like to see it mature. This is now the counter. We have a significant degree of asymmetry, live vein running right across the top here. Strong visual anchor that we have on the left side coming across the tree. That is what allows us to push that far. This has not changed. This is a consistent and design approach for objective analysis and design to take out some of these branches in the interior. This hasn't been the strongest piece back here and there's a lot of smaller branch attrition. I don't wanna cover the interesting areas, but I wanna generate direction. I want to make sure that we understand what's happening here and I want to start to find what is that nuance? Is it a slight change of angle so the angle is upwards that gives us this consistency of motion? through the tree. Is it here that we hit this before it rolls down? I don't know. This is the next point of exploration. Just dropping those. They already feel like they unite and kind of work together. I think this has to come down, but I don't think it comes down necessarily here. I think it's got to roll forward and it's got to exist in this space that we've just opened up. So let's see if we can compress and then let's see if we can roll this forward to actually get. And I'm going to start by rolling here. And I'm gonna come here, beautiful, beautiful. The way that I was formally taught in Japan, the bottom of your branches is always supposed to be flat and I still find this to be the thing that gives definition. But when you're trying to insinuate direction and elements, sometimes you have to show that float a little bit. Diagonal lines across the bottom of your branches are tricky because if you have a consistent diagonal, it makes the tree feel like it's falling over. But if this tree is dropping on the right side and we've got a little bit of upward diagonal on the left side here that's showing that element, it starts to create this movement through our branches, which is interesting, needs to be utilized in a very controlled and I think a very reserved manner, but it is there for us to pull out some nuance and aesthetic. If we want to use it, use it wisely, use it sparingly. Okay, and clearly now that we're here, this apical region has to be pushed in this direction. Sierra Juniper, very snow-oriented shape and creation in terms of causal effects. Let's take a look at that from afar. Oh, that's nice. That push in that direction is nice. Yeah, I like this. I like this a lot. Now we've got to deal with this, but that compression here, our new branching style that's dropping down there, that's very dramatic, small pads, alpine in nature. Let's go ahead and start playing over in here just a little bit. I want to keep some of that wind, but I want to show that snow. So I'm going to drop these down as well. Not all of them, just the strategic pieces that allow me to now connect the two consistently. And when I say the two, the two areas where we're pulling on this kind of nuance of this drop and this lateral and this drop and this lateral, that's really this region right here and this region right here. We need something, at least just a little hint in this space right here. Just a little peekaboo right there and all of a sudden it changes everything and that can only come from the back. It gives us that depth, really enhances that, that depth of our design. We see a bigger tree when we see these little peekaboos in the back. This is an important space in the design of this tree. Let's see if we can get one of these branches down into that region. Each time we make a big move, each time we further reinforce that design consistency, it grows in complexity. When we start talking about bones as an art form, you've got to really be influenced by the things that you're collaborating with, the medium, the environment. And that's where we start to have this different scope of working. And it should build. You should generate more interest the farther you push the design. Now that the structure is set, I'm going to settle in for the long haul. 
of wiring out the secondary tertiary branches. Once that structure is set, and focusing on the character of that already wired branch that exists on the lower right portion of the tree, I wanted to redefine how these pads were gonna be created. Manipulating that wire, having the ability to just explore and kind of tease out the nuances and aesthetics. This is where we start to get down to creating the scale and proportion of what this tree is gonna show. The bigger the pad, the smaller the tree, the smaller the pad, the bigger the tree. And there's nuances and boundaries inside of this division of foliar mass, the creation of positive and negative space, and the relationship that that positive and negative space have to each other. I'm going to walk you through this process as we continue to explore the creation of branch pads, positive and negative space, and define those boundaries between the two. Making sure that we keep proportion in mind and making sure that each pad that's created references whatever condition and environmental factor is acting on that region of the tree and that specific living dead combination that that branch is originating from. This is a really spectacular experience and exploration over design. So now we've gone through a very major portion of the secondary tertiaries in the bottom 30% of the tree. The defining branch has really worked out. That's informed and influenced how we've styled these other pads. And again, we started out with that discussion of being able to give a little bit of that nuance of that rise and that environmental factor of wind. We've got that snow working on some of the pieces farther out, the longer pieces, the longer branches, the pieces that are gonna carry that kind of change in line with that snow load. But I'm happy with the back and I like the way that some of these areas of interest just really big, long structural branches that we were able to carry into the structure of the tree and really elevate, create that body and that mass out of this. And again, this is one of those things where people say uh, a branch shouldn't grow back towards the interior of the tree. But when you look at, even in the traditional form of bonsai, the structures that are now thick and mature, that have the interesting lines and movement in them that everybody says, man, a human being can't do that. That's naturally made. Most of that is man-made, right? So the maturation process on these lines, as long as we create beautiful lines, different angles, different spaces, different planes in the movement in terms of changing up those angles and the planes that those lines exist in and spacing between those angles and bends that we create, the more random it looks, the more organic and natural it is. And that's really what's going to mature over the course of time especially at this point, the branches are as thin as they're gonna be for the future of this tree. We wanna put the most dramatic movement in now and allow it to mature and thicken. We can always cut out pieces that don't necessarily fit. We can change and transition once we get pads formed and as this design matures. And when we're looking at those depth-filled branches, the quality of that line, because we see that line from the front looking at the bottom side of that branch, the lines in those branches need to be impeccably executed in order for that quality to consistently move through the entirety of the tree. One more area I wanted to make a particular note about, and I feel like this is more an indication of age in terms of an oxen dominant, apically dominant tree, where we almost have a secondary apex here. It's a little bit obscure. Is it a secondary apex? Are we making this commitment? It doesn't have to be such an overt gesture of obvious secondary apex, but there is a very kind of pinnacle cap to the foliar mass on the left side of the tree, highlighted by this piece right here. I think it's a great transition up and in. I think this is a very natural line that would form. It carries some of that elemental influence. It is a short, stocky branch where snow would have less of an impact on it. All things consistent with the concepts of the environment and conditions that are creating the design. So this branch is really gonna give us the length and I wanna play with the mixture of elements here because I wanna show that flow of the wind coming off of this. I also wanna use these long branches to show that snow. This is where we wanna be really careful to not attach ourselves to an outcome. Okay, and that's, that's challenging. And that, and that also is, is I think another reason why we tend to go back to an accepted form and an accepted approach because when you get lost in the exploration process, it, it, it is discouraging to a degree. When you get lost in the exploration process, you can always go back to the traditional form and you're never gonna be wrong. However, 
when we're exploring, just because we don't know where we are, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're lost. We cannot attach ourselves to a direction. We can commit to it, we can see if it's gonna work, and we can always pull back and simplify it. And when we're talking about combining two elements now, if we combine these two elements and the aesthetic looks too chaotic and we don't have that delivery of that story, it's not visually represented in a way that we find appealing, go back to one. A lot of the effort when we get out to these places. We're going to see so much, so much of the branch line here. A lot of the effort at this point, contour of the pad, that mass, size, scale, these are the things that we start to really kind of lock in at this point. I'm obviously pulling off of this. I don't want to duplicate it. I don't want to duplicate it, but there is some consistency there. Now, if I have this small little piece out here, I definitely want to create a bigger mass here. That's where I'm going to pull this into that. Mm, that's nice there. This is nice. And I'm kind of liking the lateralness that's existing here. I don't need this to have that kind of drop. Typically, this is against the grain of design to have inconsistent angles that exist within your structural branches. But, but when we look at natural trees, it's very, very common. It's nothing, nothing abnormal about it from the perspective of something looking natural and having that inconsistency. It's actually the inconsistency that contributes a lot to the quote unquote natural. One of the more challenging things over the course of my apprenticeship to learn was what is the, what is the sensation and what are the triggers that something is working and what are the sensation and triggers that something is not working? Because oftentimes in bonsai design, when we continue to look at something, we say, man, I like that. And we become attached to something. And I, I, I'm no different, right? It's not like it, nobody's immune to this uh, occurrence. And I used to see Mr. Kimura create these shapes and forms that I was just like, yes, that looks awesome. And then he would say, no, nah, it doesn't work. And he would change it. And that objectivity... I admired that. I think, it's, I think it takes a lot of strength to be so objective about your work as to see something that does trigger some sort of sensation and not be so doped up by that sensation that you feel like that is the best that it can be. He knew, he knew that it could be better and he would change it for the better. Now that, that was exactly where I wanted to get and it's been a long study at Mirai. Now, when I step back, I'll actually have a much purer sense of whether or not this works because being up close, it's just right now, it's a, it's a feeling, but it's not objective. I need to take that step back and get that objectivity. And if my eye continues to go to certain areas on the tree, if for whatever reason it's drawn there, that's a bad thing. That means that it's not working. Oftentimes we tend to misinterpret our eye being drawn to an area as being a really positive thing. That's not. Right? It's, it's when your eye can take in the entirety of the composition that you've hit it. That's when you've nailed it. That's when you can feel sort of confident that your work has completely followed through. Oh, this is fantastic right here. A lot of rhythm. I could see where this is already potentially going to be too heavy and it's getting very busy. But let's go ahead and play it out. Let's see what happens. Let's not react too quickly. Let's organize. Let's thin down. It's going to change the physical mass of that region of the tree. So I'm gonna carry this back. Even though we're getting that windward section, we are gonna compress the height of, as a component of age, as a component of environment. Hmm, I like that. I like that flattened out, kind of reduced effect length. Boom, pushing out here. But I'm really using this for the length. These to drop, this for the length. Feels as though the snow is becoming the predominant force in the design, don't you think? The apex was really the last hurdle that we needed to cross, and the apex was a tough thing to form. Do we try to utilize the apex to carry forward more of the wind influence, or do we utilize the apex to show more of the impact of snow? For this tree, we've already built a lot of samples of how the upper apical region of a foliar mass can exist through these subsections of the creation of this piece, and I, I think those subsections are giving the tree a tremendous sense of scale, making that material look bigger. If we refer to the traditional bonsai method and we really um, kind of utilize every single piece as a branch as opposed to creating these different quadrants of representative standalone photosynthetic masses. You do kind of show a smaller tree in that scale and that perspective 
multiple ways to attack and to tackle that design process. But with the Apex, having all of the anchor and all of the solidarity of the design on the left side, I do have the kind of notion that we're gonna be headed to the right to carry on with the thematic of flow and of that directional length. There is also though an interesting opportunity to bring it back to the left at that final point where we may have those different influences no longer sheltering that piece and see what we can explore in terms of how that complements or works against some of the other elements in the design. And once we're finished with the apical region, we can come back and as a holistic unit, look at the tree and the design and make those final tweaks to really perfect what we're trying to communicate and convey in the work. Voila, finished. Now, I had some reservations about the apex. First and foremost, and this is something I think we can correct in the future, it's relatively vertically oriented and I would love to push it to the right a little bit further. For where it's at now, for where the structure is at, for all of the work that we've done, I'm satisfied with it, but I recognize there's one more step that we could take to improve that quality. It may require some reduction of the tissue, et cetera. I'm gonna hold off on doing that and kind of sit with the design for a little while. Oftentimes when we design a tree and you have that time to sit with it, look at it from afar, look at it up close, you start to see things that you can improve and change. But I do like the kind of upward nature that we have on the left side here. I like the downward nature we have on the right side. I think this goes hand in hand with the contour of the land and the nature and style with which Sierra Juniper is heavily impacted. At the very peak of the Sierra Nevada is the granite as protection and a guide to the elements, snow as a major impact and force that impacts this species of tree, and all of the characteristics that we had influencing and informing those decisions feels like we were able to really cap it off with a beautiful apex. Now, when we started to, and initially I had left this apical region just a little bit longer over here thinking, man, maybe that might be one of those really beautiful carryover indications. And if you look at ancient Sierra Juniper, in terms of trying to gain inspiration online, the images that come out show the informality and the freedom of that natural organic form. I want my design to embody that and I cut it short, it didn't feel quite right, it wasn't well placed in terms of where that length existed for the branches below it and the structure where that live and dead interacted. But I could definitely see a point in the future where I want to take this further towards the organic and more out of a little bit more expected bonsai form. However, I've also always recognized and openly stated that Sierra junipers are the only tree in the natural environment I've ever seen that looks so close to a bonsai form as we know it in the modern world. And that is captured very beautifully, I think, inside of this piece. A fantastic piece of material, an interesting story about how the process started. We recognized when we got into a piece of material this quickly in that demonstration that I needed to stop that process, come back to the roots and sort of uh, understand how this base of the trunk and all of the deadwood live vein characteristics were gonna inform the decisions that I made. And now having taken that time, been patient, given the tree that time to recover, explored and recognized what was obvious and what was potential in the design, we've now come to a point that I think it was a really wise decision to exercise that patience. And, and as a result, we'll move this design forward far faster and in a far better direction because of making those educated decisions in the design process. Ultimately, when I look at Sierra Junipers in the high Sierras, at the very peak of those granite domes where the influence of wind and the influence of snow impact that, it's still the closest replication to the bonsai form that we find in the natural environment to this day. And so I carried forward with the utilization of snow creating the standard coniferous apical formation, foregoing the impact of wind, recognizing that this is that moment where the branches are carrying enough context 
to really show those elements and factors acting on them. The individual pieces of the live vein and deadwood showing different trees within the singular whole of all of those pieces united. And we finally achieve the consistency of design, the delivery of that environment, the execution of those elements to create one very complex unit inside of one tree. All of these parts adding to the greater sum and this really magical final product that we were able to achieve. This is one of the most enjoyable processes I've gotten to go through as a bonsai professional and I'm really happy with the result. As with any styling of any tree, being malleable, adjusting the process, recognizing and respecting the material, these are all commonalities that we have to accept as a part of our role in the collaboration with a tree. Bonsai creator, tree, which one carries the most weight? I'm gonna say I'm gonna let the tree lead the dance as much as I possibly can, but that tree is inspiring our creativity. That tree is informing us and reminding us of things we've seen, elements we wanna represent, context and feeling we wanna to convey to people that view our work. And inside of this, this is where we get to add our interpretation to an otherwise blank canvas. The process of this tree's creation has been a, a fantastic experiment. Adapting, being malleable, adjusting our process, respecting the material, stepping back and really letting the tree lead the dance. And inside of this, what we've come to is the sum of so many small, high quality parts that come together to equal a really fantastic overall composition. I hope you learned from this. I hope you gained inspiration from this, but more than anything, I hope you just got to enjoy the beauty and spectacular nature of this piece of material that represents our native North American landscape. To learn more, start your free trial on live.bonesimurai.com. Mirai Live, the platform that has the capacity to show you each of these steps and how you proficiently approach your trees to reach a level of product and a quality in your trees that you see here before you today. I hope you enjoyed. It's been a pleasure presenting this for you and we look forward to seeing you on Mariah Live.